Welcome to episode 83 of the Luke Macias Show. Um, if you have not heard of the changes going on with our partnership with Scorecard Media, please go back and listen to episode 82 and get updated on all the exciting things happening here at the program. Uh, what what do David French and John Cornyn have in common? That is something we are going to dive into today. We're going to start with David French, and everything I say is not actually going to apply to John Cornyn, but it will transition there, and I'll show you how and when after we cover initially David French's most recent write-up. Some of y'all might have seen the news that Russ uh, Vought at the OMB Office of uh, Management and Budget at the White House announced that they would be defunding critical race theory in federal agencies. And this is a massive step in the right direction and something we should honestly praise our president and his administration for doing, which is attacking a Marxist ideology and removing it from the federal agencies. Often we talk about how educations of higher uh, institutions of higher education or institutions of even K through 12 education are often indoctrinating uh, the individual students that are in their care with a leftist Marxist ideology. But what unfortunately we are dealing with is the fact that even within government agencies that are taking your tax dollars, they're also indoctrinating people with those same ideologies. What we have with David French, who is a right of center commentator who has been very critical of the president, was critical of the president in 2016, and has become even more critical of the president since he has gotten elected, is that when opposing Trump becomes an ideology, you often will go to great lengths to justify certain things that I think otherwise you would have ran away from and much more clearly seen for what they were, which is very dangerous ideology. So what am I talking about? Well, David French recently wrote up a uh, an editorial, in essence, saying the title was On the Use and Abuse of Critical Race Theory in American Christianity. And truthfully, he took a Marxist ideology and said, well, I want to talk about the nuance in critical race theory and identity politics, which well, critical race theory and intersectionality. And then he gives them very generous definitions and talks about the positive uses of critical race theory and why they should be things that we consider using. Now, this comes on the heels of President Trump's actions, which again, going back to an opposition to the president, uh, you all of a sudden take something that is a Marxist ideology and say, well, let's talk about the nuanced benefits of this ideology. And then he concludes by basically saying, but however, the totalizing ideology falls short. And then he says, that's why we need the gospel, which is true that we need the gospel. But it's almost as if, in fact, French uses this specifically. He talks about, moreover, as a totalizing ideology, it contradicts course, core scriptural truths. So let me tell all of you why critical race theory has these benefits. But if you use it solely, it defies scripture. Well, what if you use it partially? What if you use it 80%? Does it still defy scripture? And that's the greater conversation to have. There's some things to take away, and then I'm going to go to my, my biggest, honestly, my biggest concern of what he wrote, which has nothing to do with critical race theory, by the way. At one point in David French's write-up, which you can find at the Dispatch if you would like to go read it for yourself, he refers to the Southern Baptist Convention's resolution on critical race theory. He says it is an excellent document. I'd urge you to read the whole thing but I'll highlight three key principles. And then he goes into portions of the document that the Southern Baptist Convention uh, published on June 1st of 2019. I do, however, think that it's really beneficial to go and read what Al Mohler had to say about this same resolution after it passed. The Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution on critical race theory where we, they talked about it being an analytical tool that people could use. Um, if you don't understand critical race theory, theory. You should. You should research it. I honestly am not going to go into the depths of every bit of that theory today on today's show, but I do think you should spend some more time doing it, and maybe we'll dive in deeper at a later time. I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole because there is a different point I want to make regarding French's writing, and that will get us a little bit into some of the actions that John Cornyn has shown as of late. But Al Mohler had an incredible... Uh, incredibly discerning commentary regarding the Southern Baptist Convention because his concern, which he articulated, was not that um, 
not some of the things that it specifically said, because it did not condone it necessarily, but some of the things it left unsaid. And I cannot say it as articulately as he would, so I will just read from his briefing on June 14th of 2019. He said, I did not want the resolution to say less than it said. I wanted it to say more than it said. I wanted it to acknowledge more clearly the origins of critical race theory and intersectionality. I wanted it to state more clearly that embedded in both of those analytical tools is a praxis. That is a political extension. That's abundantly clear in the original of both intersectionality and critical race theory. It is also abundantly clear in how they function in higher education and public debate. It is true that both can be deployed as analytical tools. The problem is, as Christians understand, that analytical tools very rarely remain merely analytical tools. Ravi Zacharias would say, intent is prior to content. And it's incredibly important when discerning anything that you're bringing in to consider as ideologies that you use as analytical tools to evaluate your life. That's my own commentary. I'm sorry. I started ranting. The analytical tools very rarely remain merely analytical tools. This is back on Moeller. Here's what he says. Ideas, as we know, do have consequences, and one of the most lamentable consequences, but the main consequence of critical race theory and intersectionality is identity politics. And identity politics can only rightly be described as antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to see identity politics as disastrous for the culture and nothing less than devastating for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In those words and in that statement, I find incredible clarity regarding how we are to view critical race theory, subsequently intersectionality, and then what they lead to, which is identity politics. And when we bring in this nuanced perspective that David French attempts to bring in, we are entering incredibly dangerous waters and ones that I do not think are moving our nation in the right direction. But I actually want to talk about something else as well. So in this write-up that David French gives, he starts to go through various different things regarding critical race theory or intersectionality. He then says, the end result, ironically enough, is both reductive and complex, quite simply race or gender or gender identity are not always material factors in any given historical development or cultural phenomenon. This is when he's talking about the shortcomings of intersectionality. But I, I take issue with a particular statement. He says, quite simply, race or gender or gender identity are not always material factors. Five years ago, ten years ago, gender was gender. Sex was sex. It's no surprise that David French has not, I guess, come out and so publicly decried Neil Gorsuch's ruling. In fact, he had a nuanced approach to Neil Gorsuch's ruling, where he said the word sex actually means whether a man thinks he's a woman and the fact that a man who says he's a woman is the same as a man and the same as a woman, and it gets all convoluted. We've done away with biological reality, with facts, and now we have a right of center commentator using the language of the left. And that is what the term gender identity is. It is language that the left is using as part of their crusade of identity politics. It is intersectionality. It is dividing people up, not only by your gender, but then by the gender that you think you are in your mind. It's incredibly harmful to our nation, to our state, to society as a whole. And David French is using their language. Gender is gender. There is, to, to employ the term gender identity in our own writings, we are giving the left the victory that they are asking from us. So this gets into John Cornyn. It's an interesting segue. But the point is that French, in his use of the term gender identity and separating it from gender, is ceding and surrendering the ground that should have never been surrendered. We had an interview with 
Greg Brockhaus, who ran for mayor of San Antonio on episode 36 of the Luke Messias show, and he came very close to getting elected. Uh, he was a city councilman for a time and really showed a different path towards making major inroads in urban areas. And one of the things he said during that episode, I want to say it's probably around the 17, 18 minute mark, is that... What he quickly realized when he got elected to city council is that all of the right of center individuals would play in the sandbox that the left defined for them. He said they would define the playing field and then we will jump on their field and play by their rules. And the key to making major inroads is to get out of their field and make your own field. Make your own sandbox. You play in your sandbox, let them play in their sandbox, and give the American people an actual alternative, a contrasting narrative and worldview that they can view and determine for which side they would like to participate. When David French uses the term gender identity, he's already, he's helping build their sandbox for them. And he's jumping in and he's using all their terms. I think it's incredibly harmful. And this gets us into John Cornyn. Because John Cornyn, just a couple weeks ago, came out and decided that Texas should get rid of unlicensed gun dealers. And he stomped his fist and he said, we've got to eliminate unlicensed gun dealers. What does that mean? An unlicensed gun dealer is anybody who sells a gun privately who doesn't go get permission from the government to do so beforehand and doesn't commit to send all of the data regarding every single gun purchase to the government. Eliminating unlicensed gun dealers creates a national gun registry, something that the NRA and every single gun group in the United States of America has opposed since the beginning of time because we absolutely do not believe that the government has the right or the privilege or should ever be trusted with the information on where every single gun is in the United States of America. In fact, no government ever should. The Second Amendment is instituted so that you can go hunt, but also so that you can be an armed citizenry, which keeps the government at bay. And people act as though that is inciting some type of violent action, but it's not. It's merely saying. It is the same as the people who put a sign up and say, this home is protected by ADT, right? It's the same as the reality that if you are somebody who seeks to do anyone harm, you generally, knowing that a neighborhood is well-armed, will affect your actions. And the same goes for institutions of government. They are less likely, they know the limitations of how far they can push things. And if you want to go to unarmed nations and see how far the government will push their tyrannical behavior, you will be greatly I guess surprised for some of you, but many of you would just see what you would expect to see, which is the fact that those governments are given significantly more liberty in how tyrannical they can get over their citizens because they know that those citizens pose no threat to their tyranny. So John Cornyn came out in Midland and said, we have to close and get rid of unlicensed gun dealers. And he is following... Dan Patrick's move that he took back in September of 2019 when he said that we needed to end stranger to stranger gun sales. This is if you go to a gun show or this is if you meet somebody who a friend of yours knows who owns a gun and is looking at selling a gun and you go and you buy that gun from him. Dan Patrick and now John Cornyn would like for the government to be involved in every single one of those transactions. They would like for you and the person owning the gun to have to go to the government first and tell them exactly what they're doing and get their permission before engaging in that transaction. The ironic thing is that John Cornyn is using the gentleman who sold the gun to the shooter in Odessa as an example of why we need to eliminate unlicensed gun dealers. And that shooting happened on August 31st of 2019. And that shooter allegedly purchased his weapon from an unlicensed seller. And then Cornyn goes on to say that we need to change this so that 
this never happens again. But the interesting thing is that the individual who sold the Odessa shooter his gun was already breaking the law. And they are prosecuting that man for it. So this is not a situation where we are finding a loophole in the law where the government has said this guy sold somebody who didn't deserve to have a gun a gun and he's just going scot-free. There are laws that he allegedly broke and he is being prosecuted for those alleged crimes. But it doesn't matter. There's an opportunity to get government more involved in the purchasing of firearms. Here's what the NRA said back in September. And just so y'all know, the NRA is, the they're less likely to speak up publicly against a Republican than some of the other gun groups. You have Gun Owners of America and National Association for Gun Rights and Texas Gun Rights and other smaller gun organizations that are very quick to come out and say, this Republican is calling for this gun restriction and we're going to oppose it. And the NRA is usually a little more hesitant to do so because they work more closely with the lawmakers. And you often have this within different organizations, but you have an organization that says, well, we care more about these relationships that we're forming. And it's a different tactical approach to passing policy. And so the NRA says, we want to be close to these people. So we're going to be less likely to actually uh, criticize them. Now, what you need to know though, is that that means that when the NRA does come out and publicly criticize a sitting lawmaker, that is a big deal. It is a major deal. And the NRA said that they remain on the forefront of legitimate efforts to combat crime in our country. We encourage Lieutenant Governor Patrick to join us in support of the same. They said that pushing these um, and supporting, you know, closing these background checks was a political gambit. They called it. They said these are proposals that would merely resurrect the same broken Bloomberg funded failures that were attempted under the Obama administration. And that is exactly what they would do. Obama tried to do exactly what John Cornyn and Dan Patrick last year. Now, Dan Patrick has been quiet on it since um, since he was largely criticized for it. And that's probably smart of him. And now John Cornyn has said, well, since since one statewide Republicans not talking about pushing Obama Bloomberg proposals maybe i should start since i'm in the middle of an election and he's come out and pushed for these same proposals john cornyn is playing in the sandbox of the left he's already accepted their narrative which is that if there is gun violence is because government is not big enough government doesn't know enough about every single gun that you own and if they did we would be a safer society. That is a presumption that is not only dangerous, but shows an underlying worldview that believes that government is the answer to your problems. We all remember Ronald Reagan's famous quote when he said the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But that is the mantra of John Cornyn right now as he's running across asking Texans to reelect him. He's saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Have there been violent shootings in your community? Guess what? I'm going to grow the government and take care of those. But don't worry, I'll protect your Second Amendment rights along the way. So according to Cornyn, government's not big enough, which has been my big issue with quite a few Republicans in this state. I've started to ask so many people, do you think government is big enough? And it's interesting because almost every single Republican lawmaker will tell you, no. Yo, I mean, sorry, <laughs> I get going. They'll tell you yes. So it depends on how you ask the question. But if you say, do you think the government is too big? They'll say yes. If you say, do you think government is not big enough? They'll say no. But then they go out and start talking about proposals and they go, well... We need to close this loophole. We need government to be bigger in the area of guns. Last session it was, we need a mental health consortium. We need the government to be significantly more involved with all these children in the public school system regarding all these mental health issues, even at the expense of parental rights. Well, that would mean that government's not big enough. So why are Republicans saying that government is too big while each session they grow government in various areas and sectors in our lives? It's inconsistent 
its cognitive dissonance, and it needs to stop. Episode 34 of The Luke Messias Show is one of our more listened to episodes. It's a conversation we had with Jonathan Stickland and Matt Rinaldi on guns and the future of the conservative movement. If you haven't listened to it, you should go back and listen to it. It's a phenomenal conversation, mostly because Matt and Jonathan do the vast majority of the talking, and I merely have a couple words. So you will enjoy it significantly. Um, But it's a conversation worth having because it's just as relevant when it was played back in 2019 as it is today. Because Republicans are still seeding the ground to the left as they were in September of 2019. We have to be on alert regarding our Republican statewide officials' willingness to seed ground to the left and play by their rules. We have to end the madness. The last thing I will say in closing is that Netflix came out with a child pornographic film called Cuties. And if you have not followed Twitter, you can follow me there and catch up on various different pieces of information that have been put out. I'm super grateful to Representative Matt Schaefer, who went out and called on the Attorney General to investigate Netflix for basically exploiting children, which is what they are doing. And then Senator Bob Hall and Tony Tinderholt and Brian Slayton have come out and said that they intend to work on passing legislation next session. If for some reason we are not going to prosecute Netflix, that we can change the law to do so and to further protect children from being sexually exploited in society. Uh, It was September 14th that Ken Paxton signed a letter with a Jeff Landry, which is the Louisiana Attorney General, and Dave Yost, who's the Ohio Attorney General, to Netflix, which was a good thing. I actually retweeted this and sent this around, but I do take a little bit of an issue with the letter they sent. So Matt Schaefer says, hey, Ken Paxton, I want you to see if we can prosecute Netflix because they're exploiting children. I mean, essentially saying take legal action against Netflix. And then you have lawmakers that come out and say, hey, if you can't tell us and we will pass laws that makes sure that you cannot sexually exploit children in our society and in our state. And then Ken Paxton signs a letter which says, Netflix, we vehemently oppose the continued streaming of this film. We are asking you to voluntarily take it down. Now, again, my biggest concern is if you go read, Brandon Walton tweeted out the letter, so you can go read the letter by Dave Yost and Ken Paxton signed on. But it is a letter that I could sign on to, okay? I have no authority. I'm not a duly elected public official, law enforcement official in the state of Texas. I could sign a letter saying, I vehemently oppose you streaming this movie, and I am asking you to take it down. All of us could sign this letter. The person who could do something more would be the elected attorney general of Texas. That's who could do more. And I hope that this is a little warning shot that Ken Paxton is sending because what we deserve as Texans is real, bold, immediate action on the sexual exploitation of children in our state. It's disgusting. This has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with decency and what is good and right and the handful of things that hopefully every single one of us can agree on opposing. One of those should be the sexual exploitation of children. I hope that in the coming weeks, I am coming to you with actual hard legal actions that Ken Paxton has taken or a clear explanation from him on why exactly he can't and him publicly supporting policy changes in 2021 that give him the authority to end this kind of garbage and filth in our state. With that, I hope you have a phenomenal week. May God bless you and may God bless Texas. Thank you so much for watching this video through in its entirety. If you're somebody who's been following on with the conversations and the commentary that we've been producing here, we're gonna ask you to do a couple quick things. Go to lukenesias.com. You can give us your email and sign up. We will email you new uh, content commentary conversations as we produce it. Also, you can, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can like our page, follow our page, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will just continue to ensure that when we produce content, it gets to you uh, more easily. Thank you so much for continuing to support the conversations we're producing. God bless you. God bless Texas.